Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, welcome to Caraval Pub and Fly Tying Live Thursdays. And uh, this month, um, this, the theme has been uh, saltwater flies. And tonight, uh, specifically, the theme is shrimp flies. I'm Bob Vandewater. I'm from Red Deer, Alberta. And uh, I'm a retired school teacher in Red Deer and taught for 35 years with uh, Red Deer Public School District. And uh, my wife and I have become uh, avid fly fishers and uh, fly tires. I also am the president of Cent Central Alberta Trout Unlimited, uh, the Central Alberta chapter that is. And um, I'm kind of the lead person for the Central Alberta Fly Tying Club. Did you teach Dana or uh, Troy? Sadly, they would never have passed. No, I, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, they, they seem to need the, to go to the corner often, but uh, we'll let that one go by for sure. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, first one um, is a thank you to Rob Merkley over here who uh, made a donation to uh, this effort to have the, the Fly Tying uh, Thursdays on live. And so thanks for that, Rob. That's very kind of you. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, Caravel uh, Craft uh, Brewery for hosting us, and that's fantastic. There are a few announcements as well uh, concerning next week. There is no uh, Fly Tying Thursday Live because the IF4 uh, Fly Fishing Festival is um, here in, in Calgary. So um, it'll be a week off and then uh, th uh, things will get up, get on its way and continue on. And of course, um, the boys, uh, the group of four, Dana and Tim and Troy and Steve are off to Oman on uh, January the 30th and for sure those of you who are watching and those of you around the table here tonight uh, it'd be really cool to uh, follow their travels on Facebook social media it should be a fantastic adventure I'm sure curious about how that's all gonna play out and I'm very interested in what's gonna happen with that trip should be a very cool trip um, tonight we're doing uh, shrimp patterns um, I absolutely love uh, f shrimp patterns and just so you know my, my wife and I have become saltwater fly fishing, um, I wouldn't say fanatics because I think we're more or less, we go two or three weeks a year and we quite enjoy it. And we've learned a lot from the seven or eight trips we've gone on so far. And uh, so we will share some of the things that we do and uh, um, you'll see some of the photographs that I've given to Dana to show as well. So um, let's see, I also, um, So some of the places I've been uh, fly fishing, I've been to in the Bahamas, I've been to uh, Ackland Island, I've been to uh, Abacos Island, I've been to uh, Great Inagua, and uh, got there just after Hurricane Matthew, so that was a bit of an interesting experience to see what a, um, an island very close to uh, the epicenter of a hurricane looked like after the fact. It was unbelievable. And we spend a lot of our time also in Belize specifically on Ambergris Cay and in San Pedro. We love it there and uh, we love uh, the place, we love the people there, we spend lots of time there um, and uh, it's one of our happy places to go and escape uh, our good old Alberta winters. So tonight we're going to um, be tying two flies, um, a gotcha and um, I always kind of smile when I talk about a gotcha because we talk about it, we, we call it a gacha in our house. We call it a gacha because the first guide we ever had in Belize called it a gacha and it took us the longest time to figure out what the heck he was talking about. And I said, what fly do you want us to tie on gacha? Now, I wasn't sure whether he was telling me something or something else, but he was trying to tell me the name of the fly he wanted me to tie on. And uh, it was his uh, command of English that uh, escaped me at the moment. We finally figured out that he meant a, gat a gotcha. And, Specifically, not just a gotcha, but he wanted one with nickel eyes on and he wanted a certain size, very, very specific. And we, the first time through, um, it, it was one of those experiences where we, we had lots of, lots of things to figure out. The good news was we had some of those flies along with us, so that helped a lot. So um, I'm going to just um, show you just a couple things before we get time. This is a box of uh, gotchas right here. And this box is basically the fly we're going to tie tonight. They, they are all the same fly, but tied slightly differently on different size hooks. So, for example, we've got flies at the top that are size 10. 
all the way down to flies that are size six and some size four. And so typically um, where we go in Belize, we do fish with size six, but mostly size eight, size six type flies. And probably the most important consideration as well when you're fishing with them is the weight you have on the fly. So you might have a 332nd uh, bead on there. You may have no weight at all on there. You may have a, a 1 8 bead like we're going to be tying tonight. You might even have a, a heavier bead as well. So the idea here is to match the size of uh, the, the shrimp that you're going to be fishing and alter the weight depending on whether you're fishing in six inches of water, ankle deep water, or whether you're fishing in uh, two feet of water, or in some cases you might be fishing three or four feet deep and uh, then you're going to have to uh, amp up the weight to get the fly down to where the fish are. So honestly, having gotchas and different, these are all pink ones. Um, honestly, you could be fishing with um, orange ones, chartreuse ones, tan ones, um, perhaps a root beer type color. All those kind of colors are great choices. So having a very large um, pile of those when you go um, saltwater fishing is really to your advantage. One of the great um, um, books that I really enjoy as, uh, as a, a great reference is this book right here. Uh, Dick, uh, Dick Brown has put together um, a number of fly, fly, uh, 200 flies that are saltwater flies. This is my reference book. I know I can look online, I know I can look on YouTube, but I like books and I like collecting them. And I'm not sure whether that's your, your uh, personality or not, but it's, it is mine. This is a great reference. So if you're looking to find a book that's a great reference for flies for saltwater fishing, this one has probably a really good um, variety of flies. And you'll probably notice that I would estimate uh, of the 200 flies that are in here, I would bet that 125 of them have a gotcha type um, look to them. So once you get used to tying these flies, and there's three basic types of flies that you can um, uh, tie, uh, other than crab flies, which you did last week with Tim, is you're looking at tying uh, shrimp patterns, um, like gotchas, there's Christmas Island specials, and then of course, Crazy Charlies. Now, I'm not sure how many of you heard, sadly, too, we lost um, Charlie Smith last, uh, about two weeks ago, I believe, Christmas Eve, or New Year's Eve, he passed away, the inventor of the Crazy Charlie fly. So um, a little bit of sadness, but honestly, most of the flies that we're going to be tying like this uh, probably are, um, their, their derivation came from what he um, created with the Crazy Charlie fly. So um, my hat goes off to a great man, and I know his, I believe his son still guides. And uh, yeah, so um, the flies you will tie um, tonight are, are, are basically a theme created from his, um, his um, original patterns. Okay, so um, the first fly we're going to, we're going to tie, uh, we're going to be tying two. Oh, the first one's a gotcha, the second one is a squimp. And uh, the gotcha um, we're going to tie tonight. If you, in your package, you should have a size six um, hook, and you can put that into your vise. You probably will have, um, f you should have four size six um, hooks in your package. And I am going to be using pink thread. And so I'm going to start off using pink and I'm using pink 6.0. But if you use chartreuse or if you use uh, tan or if you use root beer color, anything like that is just great because we're going to be, uh, um, the color of the thread will bleed through um, the materials we'll be using and will be your main color. So I'm going to be using pink. So. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to install um, and put in on our dumbbell eyes and we're going to do that behind the eye of the hook. And so I'm going to start off my thread a good eye of the hook back so I, I'm able to um, install um, a wing later. So we don't want to crowd the eye and you have uh, dumbbell eyes and you should have one that's a 1 8 dumbbell eye and I'm just finding a package of them. I'm going to use um, nickel ones, but uh, if you want to use, uh, you, you, you'll have one that's um, a black nickel one, which will be just as, just as good. So when you're putting them on, 
I'm basically going to measure like this and wrap two or three loose wraps then around the shank and then I'm going to straighten it and start figurating my dumbbell eyes. Take your time with that. Reason being is I like to just flip my, my vise over and make sure everything looks like it's perpendicular to the shank of the hook. And I'm just doing some figure eights to lock it in place. And then very similar, I know Troy did a, a Clouser minnow and he installed some eyes on his Clouser minnows. I like to take my thread and go underneath the dumbbell eyes and lock it in place so they won't travel around or twist. I'll just pause there just for a second while everybody catches up to that uh, particular step. I think it's really important to do a good job locking those um, dumbbell eyes into place. Typical, I like to use, you can use um, bead chain and you can get a variety of different uh, weights and bead chain to extremely light to medium and then even heavier. Um, I like using uh, dumbbell eyes, these are 1 8th. I typically will also use uh, 3 32nd dumbbell eyes as well and um, as I've been trained from my guides in uh, San Pedro and Belize, they like nickel beads or, or uh, dumbbell eyes, so I tie with nickel ones. So to make sure it's not going anywhere, I'm going to just take a little bit of crazy glue and I'm going to take the crazy glue and just make sure my eyes are staying put. Could you use head cement as well? Absolutely. Head cement is, is great, no problem at all. So just, just an interesting little thing. This is personal preference about the crazy glue, and I like using brushable crazy glue. Some folks that fish salt water don't like having any glue of any sort on their flies, and that's a personal thing. I don't mind having crazy glue on mine, and uh, I like to make sure that they're uh, reinforced and aren't going anywhere, so I like the crazy glue. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to tie in a, ta a tail, and by the way, the um, the gotcha we're going to be using, we're going to be tying, was designed by a fellow by the name of Jim McVeigh. And Jim was an oil field worker, and I, he, I believe he um, enjoyed going down to Andros Island. And um, one of the things he did that was really kind of fun that people who know him, and it's been written in some of the books, in particular um, the book I was referring to, is the wing material that he used because he, he was looking for a certain color he was sitting in a taxi cab and he saw the color of the carpet in the taxi cab. He took his scissors out and he cut a piece out of the carpet in the taxi cab and made that his wing color and that became the signature color, almost a blonde type color. And so since then he's uh, gone to using, uh, or uh, people look for blonde colored craft fur or polar fiber for the wing. But let's tie in the tail first and what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, some mylar tubing. You'll have a little piece um, probably about an inch in your package. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to just simply pull out the uh, inside part of it, just so we just have the mylar tubing. So I just pulled this out of the inside of it. And so your piece of tubing is probably about an inch long. And what I'm going to simply do is I'm going to start right behind the eyes of the hook, the dumbbell, uh, dumbbell eyes, and I'm going to tie it in and this is going to be my tail, and I'm just going to work my way all the way to the curve of the hook. Make sure it's well installed in there, and just make sure you got lots of wraps in there. The reason I started right behind the dumbbell eyes is I like my body to be even, and so I just made sure that the whole mylar tubing started right behind the dumbbell eyes and went right down the shank of the hook, and I'm going to cut it so it's about the length of the shank of the hook uh, past the curve of the hook. And then I'm just going to take the tip of my fingers and just make it fray it with my finger, my uh, tips of my scissors, and there we go. Yeah. 
if your body is a little bit rough, you can just kind of smooth it out with your thread a little bit, make it nice and uniform. Now, the next step, you should in your package have a piece of diamond braid. Now, I, if, you, if everybody just takes a look, my diamond braid is a little bit different than yours. You just have diamond braid. I have flat diamond braid. And it'll be okay. You'll have to sur survive with it. This is going to be your body material. Now, before you tie it in, you could very easily use uh, pearl uh, crystal flash as well. It would work like a darn as well for the body material. So that, that um, and some people prefer to use uh, 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 pearl crystal flash. Now, just before you do that, just take a look up here. I saw um, so, some tires. How many of you tie chronomets in this group? Lots of you tie some chronomets. Do some of you use something to taper your chronomets? Um, I have some uni stretch here, and I, you don't have this, but I'm just going to show you that you can actually create a taper or an underbody with uni stretch, and then you can just simply uh, wrap it on to create a little bit of a taper behind the dumbbell eye, so you'll have a taper from the t the curve of the hook right up to the dumbbell eye. So that's just a, a, a personal preference thing. I'm showing you that because if you get into doing that and you really like to see a nice taper to your um, to your um, gotchas, then you might want to consider using, using this. And I sometimes do that with the larger size ones. The smaller ones, I really don't, because I don't think you, you can just use thread wraps to get the job done. Okay, so I've got some uh, flat diamond braid right here. For me, your urge is just diamond braid. Again, I'm going to tie mine in right behind the eyes. Mine's a little bit frayed, so I'm just gonna give it a little trim. and just put a loose wrap in behind the dumbbell eyes and then, then just wrap it. I'm going to, what I'm going to do is just gently lift on the diamond braid and wrap it down towards my tail. And this is going to be my body material. It's also going to create a little bit of flash as well. Now, if you want to get a little more of your color of your thread, you can just do some wraps. Make sure it's nice and smooth. And then I'm going to end with my thread near the eye of the hook. When I start off uh, bone fishing, this is probably my favorite fly. And uh, we've caught lots of uh, different species with it, uh, especially bonefish, which would be the go-to reason why you, you tie it on. But uh, trigger fish, we've caught with it. Uh, I've caught... Um, a dandy permit with it. My wife's caught some permit with it as well. And so this is a fly that um, really is amazing. It does a great job. It looks great in the water. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my diamond braid and I'm going to wrap it up. Before you wrap up, just take a look because I'm going to do something interesting um, near the dumbbell eyes. I'm going to wrap through the dumbbell eyes in a very specific way. So just take a quick look. So I'm just going to start my wraps and I'm going to use close touching turns to wrap it. And when I get to the dumbbell eyes, I'm going to go over the top first. And I'm, what I'm trying to do is do figure eights, but I start off over the top And I want to try to end up underneath it with my, my diamond braid. Now you just, are, I, have fl I have flat braid, and you'll see why in a moment. Okay, so my, my, my uh, flat um, braid is now quite frayed and it's going to be kind of a little bit of flash as part of my wing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip my fly over. Now 
if you, if you um, some people might prefer to take it out of the vise and flip it upside down. So if you want to take it out of the vise and flip it upside down, that's okay. I'm gonna, um, just, I'm just gonna turn my vise. That's just a preference thing by me. But if you wanna flip it upside down, that's okay too. Okay, so I'm gonna just flip it up, upside down. How's everybody doing, by the way? Is everybody doing okay? Okay. And I'm just going, now, with your braid, I'm not sure whether it's gonna easily fray or not and, and become um, a little bit of flash. So what you might have to do, and that's because of the material you have, you might have to cut it and um, form your head, and then you might have to just take a little bit of flashaboo or uh, crystal flash, pardon me, and take two or three fibers of crystal flash and use that. Pardon me? Oh, you're going to be about, um, out to about the tail. Yeah, good question. So I'll show you what I'm working towards. I'm going to, I'm going to fold it back. And I'm just going to wrap back towards the dumbbell eyes for some flash. And the length is about the length of where the tail is. If you don't have any crystal flash, wave madly. Uh, my wife will come over around and give you some. To, so what you can do is just you can tie some in and make that your um, part of your wing. Does anybody need some uh, flash? About, uh, there is some over there. Yep. There we go. So while the, uh, the uh, crystal flash is going around, and that's the beauty of um, um, pearl diamond braid is the color that bleeds through is the color of your thread. This is, I'm using a Danville 60 thread. I just like the color of it. There's uh, hot pink colors. There's more softer uh, pink colors that people prefer. I think it's a preference thing. Um, orange is great and chartreuse. And uh, so lots of people will, will just, the colors of their gotchas will have everything to do with the thread they select. Okay, wing material. I believe everybody in their package has some uh, wing material, and it's called, I believe the wing material you have is polar fiber. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it's polar fiber. And polar fiber comes on, it looks like a little bit like this. You can see this one's well used right here. But before you um, uh, put your wing on, I just want to show you that wing material can be a wide variety of things. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so. This is called pseudo hair, and it's a synthetic as well. This is the material that was pseudo hair. Okay, so this is pseudo hair right here. So that's what you have in your package. I like pseudo hair. I just like the how pliable it is and how it moves in the water. I think it's great. This is called polar fiber. This is great stuff. Um, it is quite a bit more supple and. Um, from a time point of view, it's a little bit easier to work with. This is craft fur. And lots of people like craft fur. And they like it because it's perhaps a little bit uh, stiffer, a little bit, uh, it's not as uh, supple, but they prefer to use that. So it's a personal preference thing. Believe it or not, some people like to use polar bear. <laughs> So I know some people who uh, um, make some uh, gotchas and they, their wings are, are polar bear, which I think is very cool because it'll have a very unique uh, translucent look to them, that's for sure. Uh, I wouldn't say it, it would be the norm, that's for sure. But that, I, again, that's a creative thing and a personal preference thing, that's, that's for sure. Oh, and fox, is uh, uh, Arctic fox is, is great too. Now this is, um, this, this is a, a fox brush, um, and um, some people will buy these and just cut the fox off of it and make wings out of that. And 
So you'll often hear of a, a gotcha called a foxy rubber leg gotcha. Very, very popular. And whether it be tan or chartreuse or a light pink color, whatever it happens to be for the wing. But you have, um, uh, po uh, pardon me, you have pseudo hair. This is what the whole mat looks like. And I'm going to cut off a piece. And so here's the piece that I have. And I'm just going to preen it a little bit. And my goal is I want my wing to be about twice the length of the shank of the hook. So I'm just going to just preen it until it looks like the way I want it to. I might try to get some of the little bit of underbrush out from underneath it. Just to clean it up a little bit. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure and as I say I want it to be about twice the length of the shank of the hook so there's my measurement right there so I so this is what I do and this is a great trick I've learned from my uh, good friend Phil Rowley is when you're measuring I'm measuring with my um, with my dominant hand and that's also got my scissors in it and then I'm going to take my left hand and just pinch at that spot and then I know that's the spot I'm going to trim my pseudo hair. So I know I got it exactly where I want it to be. And I also got it in the right hand, which is in my case is my left hand because it's my non-dominant hand. And I'm going to tie in with my right hand. So as soon as I have it trimmed, I'm just going to take a loose wrap. Oh, and here's another little trick. Move your thread right behind your dumbbell eyes. Get your thread right up there, right next to the dumbbell eyes. That'll help a lot. Okay, so just a loose wrap around my pseudo hair. And I'm just gonna take two wraps and I'm just gonna look and see that it's placed where I want it to. If it's not, I will unwrap it and go again. And then I can get ever increasing tighter wraps for my head. Sometimes you have to give it a little tug just to get it right in place, but I was lucky enough that time to get it to sit down exactly where I want it to. Now, I said that we're going to make a, uh, a rubber leg gotcha, and there's lots of rubber legs out there, local legs of all different colors. Um, so these are silly legs, and I'm sure everybody here has, has encountered silly legs at some point in their travels, and I love silly legs, but I've also learned that depending on the size of the fly you're tying, that sometimes these silly legs can be a little bit large, but for what the, what the fly we're going to be doing tonight, they're going to be just perfect. Now, I believe in your package, you have some um, silly legs that have little orange tips on them. Does that sound about right? Okay, excellent. I don't have those. I'm going to use these, but just before you tie them in, I just want to show you that if I go down to size 8 or to size 10, which is very small for saltwater flies, I go to these little nymph legs and you can get those in uh, fly shops nowadays. And these little, um, these are silly legs, but they're a size smaller, they're great. And they actually meld very nicely in with the wing and they create a little bit of uh, uh, movement in the wing as well. Just, and I just like the way they, uh, they move in the water with the smaller sizes. You have medium sized silly legs and I have, mine are just um, a clear one with orange flecks in it and yours has got or orange tip. No, it's not a problem. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my thread right behind the eye of the hook. And I'm going to just simply, I'm going to just simply double my thread or double my legs over my thread and make a couple of wraps, just two wraps. One, two. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the, my legs on either side of the dumbbell eye with a little bit of tension, capture it with my thread right up to the dumbbell eyes. And then I can release the, press, uh, the pressure on the legs because I was pulling on them just to uh, reduce the amount of bulk at the head. And I'm going to trim my legs to be just a tiny bit longer than the tip of my wing. And then I'm going to bring my thread back to my, uh, the eye of the hook. Now, I'm not sure how many of you um, use Crazy Glue. I use Crazy Glue quite a bit. And I buy Crazy Glue at Michael's. I always take my 50% coupon on <laughs> and, uh, with me as I go and uh, get some... Uh, get some crazy glue. And uh, if you can't find brushable crazy glue, look on Amazon. That's a good place to, believe it or not, order crazy glue. It, it doesn't come right away, but you, you, they do, well, Amazon pretty well has everything online nowadays, even everything from toilet paper to crazy glue. So uh, for, uh, certainly it's a good place to find it if you're having trouble finding brushable crazy glue. So what I'm going to simply do, and I'm not sure how many of you are used to doing this, is I just simply gonna take the crazy glue and I'm going to just put it on my thread. I'm just going to rub it onto my thread. And then I'm going to very, very, very carefully wrap it up the eye without touching my rubber legs because crazy glue and rubber legs do not get along. And then I'm going to find my whip finishing tool. And I'm going to whip finish. And cut my thread, and we're almost done our crazy leg. Gotcha. Last thing. Last thing. And I think this is a preference thing again. Some people like to have um, some, some cross hatches on their wing. And so I have um, some markers here, and I'll have my wife uh, bring them around if you prefer to do this. And I'm going to just simply take my brown marker this makes a very very nice movement in the water Karen um, here is the colors that they probably want to work with yeah, tan and brown. This brown that I just used is great. They can use orange as well, and they can use this uh, uh, color as well. How about red? Uh, 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 no, let's leave red away. Yeah, just those colors would be great. Okay. Yeah. So when my wife and I go to Belize, we probably bring three or four dozen of these flies, starting with size 10, a dozen, a dozen size eight, a dozen size six, a dozen size four. We probably spend most of the time fishing with the size eight, and when you get really fussy fish, down to even the size 10. So that's um, uh, the rubber leg gotcha. Now, just I have a great little story to tell you about these rubber leg gotchas because I couldn't believe that this actually happened. I caught a 30 to 35 pound barracuda on one of these things. And it was one of those moments that nobody would believe it except we had the photographs to prove it. Uh, my wife and I were along with another couple and we were in, a, on Abacos Island and we had identified a bay that we were going to hike into. And we hiked in, we did some bushwhacking, and went through some uh, flats that we thought were sand which ended up being mud and uh, kind of slogged our way in there and we got to the ocean in this beautiful spot and the tide was out and we were walking around everywhere and we finally got to the water line and we could see um, barracuda everywhere we could see lemon sharks everywhere we couldn't find a single bonefish couldn't find a single bonefish. We kept walking and we knew the tide was coming in. We figured the bonefish were going to come in with the incoming tide and they did. And as the bonefish started coming in, 
the Barracuda kind of got active as well because, hey, that's almost like ringing the dinner bell. And so the Barracuda came in, or pardon me, the, the bonefish came in, and I was casting at some bonefish, and a rather large Barracuda was in the area, and for some unknown reason, he picked up the rubber leg gotcha. And of course, if you've ever seen the teeth of a Barracuda, which are enormous, and of course, I've got 16 pound uh, fluorocarbon on, I figured I didn't have a chance. And uh, it was quite the scrap, and uh, we got the Barracuda finally um, tired out, and then we realized that this thing was just monstrous, moving towards four feet long. And I asked my wife if she wanted to tail it, and she looked at me and goes, no, I'm not tailing that thing. And so I handed Karen the rod and I tailed it with, uh, and we were, the, fortunately the, the Barracuda was uh, tired enough to allow me to tail it. And we got a few quick pictures and sent it back on its way. And we kind of looked at each other and our friends were way down the beach and they were, they could see the flash from our camera and everything. They thought, oh, they're into the bonefish like crazy. We, you know, that kind of thing. But as it turned out, it was this enormous Barracuda and uh, we, were, we, kind of, we couldn't believe it had happened. And it was on a size six rubber leg gotcha, just like that. And as one of the guides in uh, San Pedro would say, a gotcha. <laughs> and for lots of considerations with this, I mean, the, the, the possibilities are endless with this. And you'll see, I have a, another box of gotchas here. These are all basically gotchas, different colors, different weights, different sizes right here. And all these flies are basically gotcha flies and uh, are on the gotcha theme. And uh, so knowing how to tie a gotcha can get you a lot of fly tying and uh, get you set up quite nicely for fly fishing in uh, the Caribbean, that's for sure. So that's a rubber leg gotcha. Now what I'm just gonna check with um, Dana over there. Um, do you want me to move to the next fly, Dana, right away? Oh, okay. He's, I did send him a picture of the Barracuda. <laughs> so I, we do have photo evidence. <laughs> so he's taking a look for that. <laughs> so these are great flies. And uh, um, some people, just, just so you can just see uh, variations, some people, what they, they will do is they'll take um, flat braid like this. And you have a slightly, you just have regular braid. And this is flat braid. And so they... There we are. There we go. There is the proof. <laughs> Caught on that little guy, if you can believe it. And so I was showing some friends and they said, it, to have that moment was amazing. I shook my head. It made the whole week that we had because the day before we had torrential rainfall. I believe we had like five inches of rain the day before and continuous thunder and lightning on the Abacos Island was unbelievably bad weather. And um, the boats that were sitting out in front of the place we had rented it all flipped over because of the wind and the rain and everything. And uh, next day we uh, took our sketchy rental car and we went down this road and uh, a road that apparently we weren't supposed to take this rental car. Didn't seem to really matter because the rental car didn't look that good. And of course, most cars, rental cars in, the, in that area, the brakes don't work anyways. And, uh, and the tires are a little bit sketchy, but we managed to get into where we wanted to go. and uh, and. Uh, the big thing that happened to help us find out where we were going to fish that day was actually Google Earth. We just used uh, Google Earth to go online to find a spot and we found some roads and we found those roads and followed down those roads and away we went. And great little tool to find things like um, uh, little creek, creek systems that go into the ocean, that kind of thing, which are usually are great fishing spots for uh, bonefish and other, other uh, tropical fish as well. So, there you go. So some people, what they do is they just simply tie in flat braid, use that as their tail, and then they wrap it up and then just tuck it underneath to be uh, the flash and put the tail on. So they can actually tie that fly in about three minutes flat, really, really quite quickly. But this is a variation from Jim McVeigh and uh, that I really like. And uh, of course, one of the things that people like to do now based on, the, on his stories and his, his uh, experiences is to find um, tail material that's as blonde as you can find. He likes, he likes, he, he always liked the blonde type colors. So that's the kind of color that I was kind of looking for. Even though I will use colors, if you're working or, or fishing in the turtle grass, you might move right to uh, a turtle grass type color as well for a wing. So that's not unusual to be doing that kind of thing or 
um, even pinkish colors, which I really like. So lots of variations and permutations that you can absolutely spend hours and days and hundreds of flies. You kind of have to control yourself because you can get out of control with this stuff in a real hurry. Okay, so that's our first fly. The second one is called a squimp, and we're going to use the exact same hook, size six. And the hooks we're using tonight are um, Mustad 34007s. And um, these are adequate um, uh, saltwater hooks. Lots of people prefer, don't like them. They, some people like uh, Daiichi 2546s, uh, um, X point hooks, um, um, TMC 811s, uh, which are quite a bit more expensive. These work overall pretty good. But if you're going to get fussier, you spend lots of time uh, saltwater fishing, you're probably upping the game a little bit when it comes to hooks. But this is what we're using tonight. They work great, and they're not that expensive. Okay, so our second fly. I'm going to be moving to tan thread as well, so I'm just going to change my thread color. And I better find myself another hook. So I'm installing a uh, Mustad 34007, size six as well. And I'm switching to uh, 10 thread. Let's see if I can actually find it here. Santa brought me another um, bobbin for my Norvice. That was very kind of Santa to, to hear my cry. <laughs> that I wanted a second one. <laughs> Expensive too, but Santa was very kind. Okay, so I got uh, 10 thread and you're going to be installing um, a 1 8 bead. Now I'm going to do something slightly different just for visual purposes more than anything. I'm going to use a 1 8 bead but it's a pseudo eye in other words, and, and, it's, and it's got a little bit of color to it. Yours is, um, yours is um, um, black nickel, works just fine and you'll see um, in the squint patterns that I have right here that um, some of the ones that have a colored eye on them. And um, I really like the new double pupil eyes that are out there. And pseudo eyes are great too. And I'm using a 1 8 pseudo eye, although you could use a 5 32nd as well, which is the next size up. Okay, so what I'm going to do is we're going to put our um, dumbbell eye in, but we're going to put it in a completely different spot. We're going to put it at the back of the hook. So we're going to start a thread right at the tip or, or where the hook point is. And we're just gonna make a few wraps to get our thread started because that's where our dumbbell eye is gonna go. So I'm using a 1 8 pseudo eye and I'm just taking a few loose wraps. I'm going to put it right at the hook point and I'm going to install it in the same way with figure eight wraps. And by the way, I know my 89 year old dad in Belleville, Ontario is watching online tonight. So I just wanted to say hi to him. I couldn't resist it. And I know he's sitting at his computer. He's probably giggling and laughing and everything else. And the ironic part is I grew up as a fisherman, but my dad was not a great a much of a fisherman although he did love to catch the odd uh, bass in the Moira River and uh, we, we would bring it home or he would bring it home we cook it up for supper for supper and always have a great time with it okay so figure eights again so take your time with that make sure you got wraps in front of the dumbbell eye If my phone dings, I bet you it's my dad. And I'm going to lock it in place with turns around the dumbbell eyes, but above the hook shank, just to lock it in place. And I am going to put a little bit of crazy glue on. Before I do that, I'm just going to make sure that my dumbbell eyes are sitting exactly where I want them to, square or perpendicular to the shank of the hook. Looks good. There we go. 
Okay, so I got my dumbbell eyes in. Now we're going to be using um, pseudo hair is what again? Let me find mine. And this is a very cool um, pattern. It's shrimpy and um, it's got a very cool variation at the end that you'll see that, that makes it very unique. And we're also going to try to um, add dubbing on in a way maybe that you're not used to. So um, I was a little worried that not everybody had dubbing twisters or was used to using a dubbing loop. So I'm going to modify it a little bit to make it a little bit easier and show you something I learned from a very wise person in, uh, from our fly tying club. His name is Evan Ritchie, who was one of the original members of our club. And Evan showed me a really cool technique that I'll share with everybody too. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by creating and putting a wing about the length of the shank of the hook on. Then we're going to add some legs. Then we're going to have some dubbing that taper from the curve of the hook down to the eye of the hook. Add a second wing, add some legs, but we're, the legs are going to be put in in a very unique way that are a little bit different that, um, from most uh, normal uh, bonefish flies. Okay. So I'm going to start off with the wing. I'm using my pseudo hair. If you need some more pseudo hair, by the way, and um, just wave madly, and my wife can deliver you some more, and you can just uh, um, snip some off. And again, I'm going to just take my pseudo hair, and I'm going to preen it and work it. And you don't need a lot here. It does not have to be thick. And I'm going to make it the length of the shank of the hook past the curve. So I'm just going to measure that about there and I'm going to pinch it because that's my measurement with my left hand and cut. And then I'm going to wrap it right behind the eye. And then I'm going to take a few wraps underneath it just to lift it up just a touch. A couple more wraps. There we go. You'll notice that my wing is not a very heavy wing. There will be more to this wing because we're going to be putting a second wing in um, underneath the fly at the eye of the hook that will complement this one and kind of join in with it as well. Okay. Let me know, by the way, if I'm going too fast. Okay, so once we have our wing put in, we're going to add some silly legs, and I'm going to use the exact same silly legs. And what I'm going to do is we're going to be um, on the side of the curve of the hook, and I'm going to estimate about halfway down the silly legs and I'm going to tie the silly legs in on one side, right along the side of the hook with a couple of wraps and I might position it a little bit just because I, I like it to be on the side. And then I'm going to flip the legs over and run them down the other side of the wing. I'm going to trim them just at the uh, tail. Some people some, oh, like, sometimes like to have them longer. That's a preference thing more than anything. Okay, I am going to move my thread to about halfway down the shank of the hook. So it's just sitting about halfway. Now I'll just wait a second while everybody catches up. I'm not sure how many of you have bone fished before, but um, I'm just going to let everybody just take a second to catch up here. Um, one of the things that can often happen when you catch a bone fish is a barracuda will eat your bone fish. And uh, we've had that happen to us a number of times where you reel in and you have a great fight going on and all of a sudden you see a barracuda cruising around and it gets your bone fish 
and the next thing you know you feel like you got this enormous barracuda on and eventually it bites uh, either the bonefish in half or it takes its head or it takes everything away. We've had that happen to us a number of times. We've had times where we've reeled in and all we had was the head. That was it. The body was gone, completely gone. Crunch. Bone, the barracuda got it. And so that does happen. We, I remember one time in particular in, um, uh, on Ambergris Cay, we were fishing um, a bay up in the north part of the, with a, our guide and uh, I had a really nice sizable bonefish on and uh, this enormous barracuda um, came over and grabbed it and the guide was giggling away. My guide friend Hillian was just laughing, he thought it was pretty funny. He knew it wasn't going to end well and uh, it didn't end well for the bonefish, it didn't end well for me because he ate everything, came back with just, a, just my tippet left and that was it, it ate, ate, even the, ate, ate my hook as well, everything it was just gone. Oh but we estimated it was over three, three and a half feet long, big, big barracuda. And uh, the, the bonefish I had on was moving towards three pounds, but that was just a tasty treat for it. So unbelievable. Okay, now we're gonna do something just a little bit different. You have, I gave everybody a little square that looks like this. Believe it or not, what it is, is a little piece that I cut from a mouse trap pad. That's what it is. So this is a really cool idea for putting dubbing on thread. And there's a technique called touch dubbing. And um, for those of you who are watching online, if you want to use a dubbing twister or if you want to use um, um, dubbing wax, that's great. We're going to be using a, a little piece of a mouse uh, trap pad. And so what I'm going to do is you have some dubbing in your package and I'm just going to find mine right over here. That's what I'm going to use right there. And all I'm going to simply do is I'm just going to open up and just peel the, the paper back so a little bit of the stick, I'm not going to pull it all the way off, I'm just going to pull it back so some of that sticky part of the mouse pad is there so everybody can see that. And I'm just going to rub my thread with it without being too aggressive so you don't break your thread. Just rub it with the mouse trap pad. Don't overdo it. Your thread now is incredibly sticky. <laughs> incredibly sticky. You have to be careful with this technique because you don't want to mat your, your dubbing down. You want your dubbing to... to and that, um, to be uh, not exactly clumped down. But all I'm going to simply do, you can just see how, how, how good this is. All I'm going to do is touch the dubbing you have to your thread and it sticks on there. Isn't that cool? If you want to twist it on a little bit, you can. But this is going to be your body material, and I'm, uh, the tan dubbing you have. And before you wrap your dubbing, just take a look at what I'm going to do um, because I'm going to probably have to do it in two steps because I haven't got enough dubbing on here. I'm going to work my way back to the curve of the hook, put a couple of wraps there, a figure eight wrap through the dumbbell eyes, build a little bit of a thicker body right behind or in front of the dumbbell eyes and then start to taper it down as I move towards the eye of the hook. So I'm just going to add a little bit more dubbing. And I'm just going to touch it. Kind of a cool little technique. And so if you're using Antron for dry flies, for example, I wouldn't do this because Antron is really easy to work with. It'll spin quite nicely on your fingers around your thread. But there's lots of other synthetics that don't, don't spin on really easy. Touch dubbing works great. And if, you're not, if you don't like doing dubbing loops, I don't mind doing dubbing loops, but there are people who do mind doing dubbing loops, that you can just do a touch dub like this. And this little mouse trap trick works really great. And the interesting thing is these things last forever. Um, one, the, this package of mouse trap um, pads, I think we bought four um, for four bucks at Canadian Tire, and it probably will last me and about 10 people for 50 years. <laughs> so it doesn't take much. So it's kind of a cool thing. 
Dubbing wax works nicely as well if that's what you prefer to use. I like this because it's just one little rub and it is great and sticky and I'm, I just love using it and it's a great little tip and uh, my friend Evan Ritchie in Red Deer showed me that trick. I thought it was very unique and very, very cool. And I'm trying to create a tapered body right to the eye of the hook. So as you move towards the eye of the hook, you want to make your body just a little thinner or tapered towards the eye of the hook. And once you get there, a little thicker towards the dumbbell eyes, a little bit thinner towards the eye of the hook. So as you're working on that, I just want to show you some cool dubbing that you can use that I came across thanks to a person I guided in uh, Manitoba. My friend Steve Anderson from San Francisco sent me this stuff from a company called the Fly Tires Dungeon. And I don't, um, it's really cool because it has little pieces of orange rubbery material in it. And it's very cool. I'll just turn it like this so you can see what it looks like. Uh, hopefully you can see that. But it's very cool. And it makes for a very lifelike body and there's a number of different types of it. And I do know that Hair's Ear dubbing does have like a wiggle tail type of material that installed in some of their dubbings as well. But I saw this, I absolutely love it. Orange is a great trigger for bonefish at times. And this color right here, I do make some uh, squimps with this uh, particular uh, dubbing, it's very cool. I also uh, like using UV2 material as well. And this is Spirit River, I know that uh, hairline now um, uh, has, has bought the, the Spirit River line and so if you're looking for Spirit Liv River material if, if, you're a shop, if your local fly shop has it and you like it great um, but you probably will find it under the hairline name in the future is that correct Troy as, as going yep yeah exactly so hairline will be distributing it as well okay so what I'm going to do once I got my tapered body, hopefully we're all kind of caught up to that stage. Oh, if, if you want to, if, you know, if your um, body looks just a little um, compact for you, you can just take something like a little, um, little piece of Velcro, and I got Velcro on a stick right here, and you can just uh, tease it up a little bit to make it look a little more buggy on both sides. That's a personal preference thing more than anything. What's that? Oh, Morris. My buddy Morris made these up. Morris Syke made these out, and he is a, certainly a, 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 a gentleman in our fly club in, in central Alberta. We, one of the beautiful things about what we do in, in Red Deer is we meet every Monday night. We run 16 sessions a year, and uh, we, that includes one all-day fly tying session with my buddy uh, Phil Rowley, and uh, we're, we'll be doing that on February the 2nd, so if anybody's interested in all-day workshop where all the materials are provided all you have to do is bring your fly tying tools for 45 bucks you take in a lot of uh, still water knowledge from Phil and uh, you can get a hold of me and uh, certainly uh, get yourself signed up for that so uh, we usually take up to 35 people right now we got 27 signed up for it and it almost always sells out so if you're interested in that kind of a thing just like, get a hold of me it's a fantastic after uh, our all-day workshop and this is the 10th time Phil has done this for our club it, and every one of them has been sold out. It's been very cool and uh, so but we have had folks come from Calgary, Edmonton, um, all around central Alberta as well to join in with us. Okay so my thread, my tan thread is just behind the eye of the hook and we're going to install our second wing with our pseudo hair. So I'm just gonna cut a piece off of my patch of pseudo hair Going to do the same thing. I'm just going to do a little bit of preening with it. I want my second wing that we're going to install right now to basically join up with the tip of the first wing we put in. 
So I'm going to do a little bit of measuring with that. So they're going to kind of combine once we work that a little bit. So I measure it, take my left hand and pinch it where I want it. And we're going to tie that in right behind the eye of the hook. On the, on the top, I flip my, my fly over. Yeah, right on top, just right behind the eye, but you don't want to make it travel too far down the hook. Just tie it right in there. Yeah, I'm t I've turned upside down, yeah. No, I'm not upside down, Rob, my fly's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. What I love about this fly, as my, uh, my, my fly fishing buddy, uh, Dr. Bill Young, would say, this looks very earthy. He likes earthy colors. He doesn't like bright colors. He likes the, the earthy colors. Uh, he keeps reminding me of that all the time. So what we're going to do next is very cool. We're going to tie in a second leg, but it's going to be a very unique way of tying, it, tying in these legs. So get another silly leg. And what I'm going to do with my silly leg is I'm just going to simply double it over and cut it in half. We're going to, we're going to be using half on each side. And put it someplace where you'll remember where the second half is. Often I don't, and he ends up on the floor, or the dog gets it, or something or other. So, when we tie in this half of a silly leg, we're going to tie in half on one side, and then the second half on the other side. Now, this is where it's unique. We're going to be tying in the leg about at the two-thirds mark, so one-third is in front of the eye of the hook. Just take a few loose wraps, position it. So you're going to have about two thirds behind, about one third in front. And then everybody, you can do the same thing on the other side. Take. Don't make, take too many wraps until you position it right on the side of the hook, right behind the eye. There we go. I, I did skip one minor small uh, uh, step, which is actually quite minor. I was going to take a single piece of, uh, f of uh, crystal flash and um, add it to the wing on, on the sides of the wing. I forgot to do that, but I'm not going to worry about it at this stage of the game. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim these legs. So the legs out front are a little bit shorter, about two thirds of the length of the shank of the hook. And the legs at the back just past the curve of the hook. Make sure you trim the right leg. <laughs> I've been known to do that too. There we go. So the neat thing about this fly when it moves in the water is these legs pulse and they move. Isn't that cool? So they pulse in the water. So the fly will be upside down like this when it rides and it's going to pulse back like this. Great little trigger. Great little trigger. It's very cool. Now to end off what I'm going to do I'm going to take a tiny bit of dubbing and clean up the thread in between, in between the, uh, the silly legs. So I'm just going to put a little bit on my thread, just a touch. Make a couple of wraps in there. Just to tidy it up a little bit. For those of you who watch Davey McPhail on, uh, uh, in his fly time videos, very, very popular fly tire, he would say at this point, tidy up. He's English and a very skilled tire. I love watching his work on, online. And uh, so I'm just cleaning up right there. And then I'm just going to take my whip finishing tool and whip finish. And I am done. Now, one of the things 
you'll notice I didn't do this time is I didn't put any glue on it and or any crazy glue. I did that for a good reason and that is these silly legs are way too close to the crazy glue and what happens is if the crazy glue uh, touches the, the, uh, the, the silly legs it can become all crinkly and look kind of all weird and gibbled and all that rest. So I did miss one minor step and that was to add um, the crystal flash into the wing, add that in. We'll do that when we're uh, having a beer and tying the second one. <laughs> we'll try to remember. I absolutely love the way this fly looks in the water. It moves beautifully. It's very, very cool. I think sometimes in fishing and even in the ocean fishing that fish see enough flies that to show them something a little bit different, a little bit unique is a good strategy. Whoops, a daisy mine popped out of there. So there we are, a squimp. Oh, if there was one fly? Oh, that's a great question. I would, I would for sure, it would be a rubber leg gotcha, probably a light pink color. I am very partial to uh, this uh, uh, color right here um, that is made, it's a Danville 60 thread and uh, um, your local fly shop will have it. Um, I know that uh, UTC's got a, a, a shrimp, I think it's called shell pink, I, I believe that is very, very close to it as well, which is also a really good choice. Now, when you make gotchas as well, I, I'm glad you actually asked me that question because we tied the gotchas with flat braid. And even though we're using pearl, flat braid will come in chartreuse. And you can get shrimp pink as well. And uh, you can tie with these colors quite nicely and gather those. My preference is for flat braid, flat. And uh, there's, uh, there's uh, braid and then there's flat braid. The flat braid is a lot easier to work with for tails, bodies, um, for um, flash in your wing, that kind of thing. It's all one piece, all, all encompassing, works really good. One little side note about squimps. I know some people who like to take a little bit of cactus chenille and wrap it around their dumbbell eyes to create a little bit of a focus spot there as well. And whether it be a compliment or complementary color, um, that kind of thing, or uh, something that matches, they do that just to create a little bit of spiky look to it too. So cactus chenille um, in small or extra small works great for that. So there you have it, two flies, the rubber leg uh, gotcha or gotcha and a squimp and the only reason I told, uh, uh, the rubber leg gotcha is probably, as, as you probably can tell, I tie a lot of them and I use them a lot. And also just a little side note, I uh, often leave my flies uh, with the guy uh, who's now become my friend in uh, San Pedro and he uses them in his guiding and uh, it makes me smile to do that. I do know that when Belizeans try to buy things online and have them sh uh, shift into their country, that um, the duty on anything that comes into the country is almost 50%. So they might buy a fly from the States for $5 and the duty is 50%. So that fly costs now $7.50 US to them. And if they're, if they're buying large numbers of those flies, um, it becomes a very expensive venture if you're not a fly tire. And I know lots of the fly shops tie their own flies there for a good reason because they're expensive to get, bring them into the country. Oh, uh, favorite fish on the flat? Oh, permit for sure. <laughs> oh, permit fever. Um, yes, and, and permit is, is one of those fish that will absolutely tear your hair out. You will fish and cast to them. And they won't eat. They're tough to hook. They're very, very fussy. And uh, you can spend the whole day on the flats chasing permit and having shots at permit, not catch one and go back and at the end of the day and think you had an amazing day even though you didn't hook one of them. But eventually you have to be rewarded 
Uh, this last year, I was fortunate enough to catch the largest permit that I've ever caught. And uh, I actually um, caught it um, um, in a lagoon area um, off of Ambergris Cay in a, in a spot that um, is very popular with the guides in uh, San Pedro. And I was very fortunate to be persistent, make lots of casts, chased after. The, there was a pot of permit and I was able to land a permit that was in the 12, 13, perhaps 14 pound range, which was very cool. We had caught permit before, but most of the permit we had caught were in the two pound, three pound range, which is still fine, it made us pretty happy, that's for sure. But uh, to catch a larger permit like that was pretty satisfying and certainly made our trip last year. That was very cool, yeah. And what did I catch it on? A pink rubber leg gotcha. And it's actually, it's a very interesting discussion point because lots of people will only fish for permit with crab flies. And uh, because it, it's kind of the, the thing that we know that permit like to eat, but I've had a reasonable luck and I've been encouraged to use them. The most important factor in the fishing, um, um, the, the, the shrimp flies is getting the right weight, getting it in front of it. And if I was giving bonefish fishermen or even new bonefish fishermen any advice, is really work on your casting. That includes myself. Becoming a strong double haul caster, being able to deal with wind is something that's part of the Caribbean experience. And if you're, if you're uh, being defeated by the wind, it's pretty tough to get your fly into the game. So practice casting before you go, whether you can find a gym or on a warm Chinooky day, anything that will work to get yourself out there practicing your casting, it's well worth it. The other thing that my wife and I do is we fish with, uh, we fly fish uh, flats with eight weight rods and we use, we match it up with a nine weight line often. And uh, our, we, we have been using real quick shooter lines and we love them and they've worked well for us. And this year we're gonna try some, um, some clear lines that are very, very cool, uh, clear floating lines. There's not very, very, very many of them. Airflow makes a really good one. And we're gonna give that a go this year. Mm -hmm. Again, we're going to overline a little bit and we think that can help us. On a, on a relatively low wind day, and a low wind day would be under 10 miles an hour. A typical is 10 to 15, and sometimes it gets up to 15 to 20, and then your options for where you're going fishing go down and diminish, but you're dealing with the trade winds all the time. So that's a very typical thing. Oh, and yeah, we're just about ready to wrap up, and I know here we're gonna tie one more of each fly, but again, I just, um, just uh, the announcements that uh, I had at the start of the day um, of our session here. And the first one was just thanking Rob for his donation, which is fantastic. And uh, Caraval Craft Brewery, fantastic facility. My wife and I, as soon as we walked in, we go, oh, we would just love to be able to tie our flies. Sorry, Troy, we do it. We tie in Troy's fly shop, West River Fly Shop in Red Deer. That's where we do it. We push everything to the side. We jam 25 to 30 people into the back room. They're like and it's a little bit tight in there. It would be nice to have a nice facility like this. Remember, next Thursday, there's no fly tying because it's IF4 Film Festival here in Calgary, and things get going again. And then, of course, keep an eye on those uh, adventurous guys that are heading out to Amman on January the 30th, and uh, certainly Dana and Troy and Steve and Tim are going to have a great adventure. I'm going to be watching every day to see what they're getting into. It's going to be kind of a cool experience. And this, this experience for me, this is the first time I've worked on this side of the camera, I work quite a bit on the other side of the camera uh, with my buddy Phil Rowley. I do, uh, he and I do lots of uh, fly time videos. And, uh, but the person who's on this side is usually Phil, and I'm usually on the other side, and I'm usually the editor. Um, if you look at Phil Rowley's uh, YouTube channel, uh, the, the, uh, the fly time videos there, he and I have collaborated to put those together and put them online. So thank you very much, everybody, and thanks for having me. And, uh, I thank you. I wanted to thank Dana too because this is a kind of a, a very cool experience for me and Troy, my friend uh, from West River Fly Shop in Red Deer. We've had lots of cool things happen. This is a new new experience for me, and I've quite enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the last little bit as well. And enjoy, guys that are here with your your beer and tie that second fly, and we'll do that one more time. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.